it's surprising how few university students can really define for you the subject that they study. In the first lecture of your first year at uni, a lecturer will often say, just discuss amongst yourselves, what do you think X is, be it politics, psychology, physics, or as it may be, economics. Now, for a first year to find this difficult is obviously very normal, but when you've got third year economics students reaching the last lecture of their degree and still kind of thinking, what exactly am I doing? What is all of this really for? I think that's where you have a problem. But that's what's happening now. 60 student organizations in 30 different countries have signed a letter saying they demand a change in the way their degrees are taught. I'm here to tell you why we think we need to rethink economics. So to try and get to the bottom of how economics sort of is defined at the moment, I thought I'd do what any student does when they're trying to find out about something, looked it up on Wikipedia, and this is what you find. Economics is the social science that studies the behavior of economic agents. Agents are assumed to act rationally, have limited resources to obtain desirable ends, have a set of stable preferences, a definite overall guiding objective, and the capability of making a choice. Now, that's a tiring set of requirements, I think. And if you don't understand, that's fine. We're going to try and break it down. Economic agents is just people. So people who are rational, know what they're doing, use the limited amount of stuff that they have to make decisions. And they're totally capable of making that choice. OK. So as an economy, what is it that we aim for? Well, politicians are always talking about this idea of economic growth, right? We really want economic growth. So I thought I'd ask Google what that one means. And Google says, economic growth is an increase in the amount of goods and services produced per head of the population over time. So these are the two guiding notions of our economy. People who are rational and know what they want make decisions about buying stuff and making stuff so that on the whole, we can just make more stuff per person over time. I really want to challenge this idea of economics, and I'm going to do that in three ways. First, I want to talk about this, this idea of economic growth. We need to rethink what we mean by growth and realize that economics isn't just about numbers, it's about values. Currently, the way that we value our jobs is by a number on a piece of paper that says how much profit you've generated for the company that year. But I argue that our teachers and our nurses and our academics and our carers generate value in a way that just can't be calculated on a monthly basis. We need to rethink economics when young parents are being told, I'm sorry, you know, we just can't afford to pay you another week of maternity leave. And yet somehow that company can afford to pay their CEOs the average yearly British wage within a week of the new year. We need to rethink economics to see that profit and making more stuff just can't be our ultimate goals. Sustainability and equal opportunity in a fair society are ideas we need to incorporate into what we call growth. The second way I want to challenge that definition is the idea that we're achieving desired ends, because although that's true, our decisions also have all sorts of other ends which are not only undesirable, they're also unsustainable. This is a picture of a landfill in Indonesia. Every single year, developed countries export 12 million tons of rubbish to developing countries on the grounds of efficiency. Rich countries can happily just produce all this waste, and then it's cheaper, rather than to deal with it at home, to send it to a poorer country that's happy to take it for the price that you pay to handle it their way. Now, everybody wins, right? They get our money, and we get rid of the waste. But I argue this efficiency is just not enough. The environmental hazard posed by these landfills is too much for our planet to handle, let alone the health hazard to the 2,000 people that live in this landfill and the thousands that live in equal places around the world. We may have achieved this desired end of efficiency, but I argue that the long-term cost just isn't worth that price. My third issue with that definition of economics is the idea that we're all rational actors, because... I mean, I don't know about you, but I have no clue why I make half the decisions that I do. And if I made them on another day, I might make a completely different one. We're influenced by our family and our friends, by the media, by what celebrities are wearing, an unbelievable amount of factors, which mean that as a species, we're just not as predictable as an economist might like us to be. Second of all, our ability to make the right choice in economics is really constrained by the fact that most of us have never studied it in our lives. Unless you choose economics at A-level, you're probably never even going to say the word at school, let alone look at a textbook. But 
everyone turns 18 and then has to vote on policies about taxes and about healthcare benefits and about education, all of which are fundamentally related to economics. So where do you go to try and find out what kind of a decision you should make? Well, most people open up a newspaper, right? So see how reliable that is. So this newspaper is talking about George Osborne pledging £12 billion cuts in government spending after the next election. Okay, he's pledging, that's like a promise, right? So we promise good things, and he's cutting spending, which means he's saving money, which means he's saving me taxes. So that sounds great, right? I love this policy. But then you look at another paper, and it says Osborne targets benefits and slashes public sector jobs. Well, that just doesn't sound as nice as the other one. He's slashing things and targeting benefits. And actually, I always thought benefits were this really good thing, right? Because they helped people with housing problems and healthcare and free education. So now I don't know what to think about this. And the problem is any 18-year-old would be stumped. But worse than that, 21-year-old economics graduates could very easily also be stumped at how to handle this situation because they've just finished a degree which says that it's value free, so it doesn't have to handle issues like what's the best economic policy for social welfare. Instead, you look at mathematical models for three years that don't often apply to reality. So, sorry Wikipedia, I'm not happy with your definition. Um, instead, I thought we could look at another. Alfred Marshall said, economics is a study of man in the ordinary business of life. It inquires how he gets his income and how he uses it. Thus, it is on the one side the study of wealth, and on the other, and more important side, a part of the study of man. We need to rethink economics to remember that economic incentives are only part of what motivates people. Definitions of community and success and your place in society vary unbelievably around the globe, yet understanding them is essential to writing economic policy that works. A policy could very easily work wonders in one country but fall to pieces in another if an economist hasn't really studied what makes that country tick. We need to rethink economics to remember that economics, history, politics and culture all go hand in hand. So this is why students are rethinking economics. We need to re-establish what's important to us. Is it profit? Is it making more stuff? Or is it more than just that? We're trying to campaign for an economics education which addresses the most important issues of our time, the environment, our relationship to each other, and our relationship to the rest of the world. Thank you very much.